turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. We we're in Colossians 1 uh, last week, and we'll be there this week, and Lord willing, next week is just kind of share with you some thoughts uh, about ministry that I've been thinking from sabbatical. And then uh, after next week, I'm going to, um, we'll be in July, and I'm going to be gone a couple weeks in July, just because I'm exhausted, quite frankly, um, whole week back. No, uh, we have some, uh, some family commitments, extended family commitments that we'll be at in a couple weeks in July. And then in August, uh, so we'll be doing some other things. And then in, in August, we'll begin looking uh, through the Pentateuch. Spend, we're going to spend quite a little bit of time in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And uh, so we're going to be in the Old Testament and look forward to just some of the things that God will be teaching us through that study. But we're in Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Looking at verses 24 through 29, some things I learned about ministry, my ministry specifically uh, during my sabbatical, and then hopefully as we look at these things, they're encouraging to you as well. And so if you would uh, stand with me in honor of God, if you're able to, to stand and uh, as we read his word, and I'm reading uh, from the English Standard Version, Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29, and here's what Paul writes about his ministry. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them... God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. You may be seated. May God encourage us through the, the reading of his word together this morning. Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, we do uh, this morning, just as we just sung, express wonder that we're in relationship with you. We are in wonder as we consider who you are, and then as we consider who you are in, in light of what we know about ourselves, we are just amazed that you redeemed us, you brought us into relationship with you, and we, we praise you for that this morning. There are things that we ask you for as well. Uh, we ask that you would uh, be with hearts who are hurting this morning. We pray for those who are discouraged about various things in their life, the lives of those they love, the life of our country. For those who are discouraged, we pray for encouragement them to find their, their peace in, in you. We pray for those who are hurting physically. We know that there are some in our church who are in the hospital. We pray for their health. We pray for those who have uh, had babies or having babies uh, this, this week, children. We, we pray for the health of moms and, and young ones. We pray for our mission trip teams who are traveling. Even now, we but ask for your, your gracious hand upon them as they travel and then as they, as they come home. We uh, lift them up to you. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would open our hearts this morning to understand it, to know it, and as we know it, to know you, and then to, to praise and glorify your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On Wednesday, I was uh, talking with, with someone and sharing a little bit about my, my sabbatical. And I said, look, um, I, I appreciate you sharing about what you've read and, and things like that, but um, we want to know, how did your kids do? What are, how, how are your kids feeling about the sabbatical? How, how was it for them? I said, well, don't worry. Uh, the kids had a great time. In fact, my son uh, several times had, had this prayer. He would say, we were praying, and he'd say, and God, please help me remember this is a sabbatical, not a vacation. 
Uh, and what he was saying that because he had heard me tell people, no, no, it's not a vacation. It's not an eight-week vacation. It's a sabbatical. I'm, I'm working. And um, it was very hard for him, though, because it, it sure seemed like a vacation. I mean, we were going to Universal Studios and Legoland, and we're going to the beach, and Dad's taking him out for ice cream a bunch, and uh, we're going to, to Trampoline World or something. I mean, it sure felt like a vacation to him. Uh, the kids had a great time. And uh, it, there, were, there were a lot of just, just fun things we did. There were some great spiritual conversations we had with our kids. We, we finished uh, reading through the Bible, n- not just during the sabbatical. That had been like a seven-year journey our family had, had been on. And we were reading through the Bible and finished that up uh, while we were on sabbatical and uh, started again. So we're, we're excited about that and read it, some good books together, fun books and, and some books with some a devotional aspect to them. So just a, a great time for our family. We also, uh, I also, uh, while the kids were at the pool some, uh, spent some time here in Colossians chapter 1, uh, thinking through, okay, if the Lord allows me to continue in ministry, grants me health, uh, prote- protects our church, uh, allows uh, through the, the confirmation of you and the elders, allows me to continue here and it doesn't return, uh, you know, could I, could I last another 30 years here if by God's grace or, or more? Uh, it'd be kind of cool to be here 40 years. Who knows what God, but if, if the Lord allows me to do that, allows me to continue serving him here, what do I want my ministry to look like? And I came to Colossians 1, verses 24 through 27, and, and thought about some things that, that Paul says here. And remember, we've, we've talked about what's happening here in Colossians. This is a book that Paul writes to some people that he doesn't necessarily know all that well. Uh, these are, are people who uh, were probably brought to the Lord through the ministry of a man named Epaphras. Epaphras traveled and saw Paul, we think maybe whenever Paul was in Ephesus in 52, 55 AD, and then Epaphras takes the gospel back and, and shares it with the Colossians, and they start a church, and there's some problems that enter that church. We're not exactly sure where they started, who they originated from. Maybe it was some of the pagan philosophers, maybe with some Jewish philosophers, but somehow this, this ascetic teaching begins to infiltrate the life of the church, these ritualistic ideas that we have to look a certain way or, or observe certain things, eat certain foods or not eat certain foods, and that teaching kind of infiltrates the church in, in some ways. We're not sure how much it infiltrated the church, but some people at least were affected by it. And even though we're not exactly sure what it looked like and how that all played out, we know what Paul believes the solution is. The solution is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Whatever wrong beliefs they have about God and how to be found right before God, whatever wrong ideas they had there, the right idea is is the gospel, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 1, Paul, first of all, talks about the beauty of Jesus Christ, his, his unsurpassing excellence, and, and, and how glorious Christ is. He's the, the source of all creation. He's the sustainer of all creation. He's the purpose of all creation. He's fully God. And then in verses 24 through 29, Paul gets very personal. He talks about how he became a, a minister of that gospel a minister of that good news. These are some very personal words that Paul speaks here. And they're very personal for for me as well. Personal things that that I'm sharing with you that God has taught me about my ministry that I hope will be helpful for you as you think about the ministries that God has called you to as well. And even though they're personal, personal words for Paul and personal words for me, Really, they're not about Paul. They're not about me. They're not about you. These words are ultimately about Jesus Christ. So there's there's three things that I I share with you, uh, things that I want to be true about my ministry. Uh, The first thing, and I talked about this last week, is I want to suffer for your sake. We see this in verse 29 where Paul says, I I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I want to I want to to suffer for you. And we talked about last week how me suffering for you is, is, first of all, gain for me. It's good for me to get to suffer for you. There is eternal reward as I suffer for others. There is benefit in knowing who Jesus Christ is as I suffer for others. There's benefit for me 
in suffering for you. That's one reason I want to do it. I also want to suffer for your sake because there's gain for you. You benefit if I go through difficult things for you. You understand more about the beauty and the the price, the preciousness of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is, is is brought into focus as I suffer for your sake, and that's joyous for me, and so I I want to suffer for your sake in that sense as well. So it's good for me, it's good for you, and it's also good for us. Suffering for you, me suffering for you is, is gain for us. It helps us in our relationship with one another. It helps us understand what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, where he says, If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member rejoices, all rejoice. As we endure suffering for one another, we understand more about what it means to be in in relationship together, to be a part of the same body. And when I talked about this a little bit last week, I I think it struck a chord with some of you. I, I talked about the need to publicly declare your affiliation with one another, your commitment to the body. I talked a little bit about church membership, and several of you asked me some great questions about that this last week, and we'll talk more about that next week as we talk about being mature, complete in Christ. But we see the reality of being in the the body together as we suffer together. So the first thing, I want to suffer for your sake. The other thing that I want to do is I, I want to proclaim the beauty of Jesus Christ through the teaching of the Word. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And the third thing, we'll talk about this again, Lord willing, next week, is I want to present every person complete or every person mature in Jesus Christ. Those are three things that I want to be true of my ministry as God allows over the next weeks, months, years, decades. So let's, let's dive in here into this, the second one. The second thing we see here in verses 25 through 27, I want to proclaim the beauty of Jesus Christ through the teaching of the Word. And Paul here describes this ministry of proclamation that he has in verses 25, 26, and 27. And let me say this. It was a wonderful thing to be on sabbatical. But I'll tell you this. It was also really hard not to have the opportunity to preach it each week. I would go to a church, and I would uh, hear a person preach, and it was great, but I'll tell you, man, it was also really, really hard not to get up there, you know. Hey, let me me take over. Let me me do this. I got a couple things I want to say. I want to add to that. And so it's kind of hard to to sit in the pew. You guys have a tough job. (laughs) Some of you are nodding. This is a rhetorical statement. And it was, I loved listening to the, the guys uh, who filled in while I was gone, very godly guys. And I benefited personally from listening to the sermons, but it was also, it was, there was some tough aspect of that as well. I mean, I, w- I, wish, I wish I was preaching this week. I don't know why God has allowed me to have this opportunity to get to, to, to stand in this place and get to open God's word to, to people who love him. I, it's, it's a privilege that I don't think you can fully understand because I I certainly can't fully understand it. Here, Paul says, this is what I want to be true of this ministry. As I I think about this incredible privilege that God has given me, there are things that I realize as I look at these verses, things I realize must be true of my preaching ministry. And I want to share some of those things with you this morning as, as we look at these verses. The first thing first thing is this. I must preach as a servant of God. I must preach as a servant of God. Look at verse 25 in your text there. He says, at the end of verse 24, he says that the sake of his body, that is the church, and then he says, of which, that's of the church, of the church, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now, there's three people that I want you to notice there in that verse. The first person that I want you to notice is God. And what does Paul say about God in that verse? He says that my my ministry has come 
from God. It's, it's the word of God. God is the originator of this message that Paul has been called to proclaim. He's the source of authority. The message comes from God. In fact, in the book of Galatians, Galatians 1, as Paul describes his ministry, he talks about how he became a minister of the gospel and how that, that message came from God. In verse 6 of Galatians 1, he's talking about how he's surprised that these people in Galatia are deserting God and, and the gospel, turning to a different gospel. And then he talks about his ministry of the gospel. Verse 10 of Galatians 1, he says, For now I am, see- for it, he asks the question, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Whose approval do I want? Am I trying to please men, he asks. For if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And then he says in verse 15, But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Now, as we look at Galatians 1, what do we see there? We see Paul is making it very clear. This message comes from one person. It comes from God. It doesn't come from any other man. It's not like a guy sat down and said, hey, Paul, uh, here's some thoughts I have about God. Thought you might want to hear these and maybe teach others. Paul said, that's not what happened. Paul says, the message didn't come from me. If the message came from me, I'd still be persecuting the church. You know, like, you know my history. You know my testimony here. I was a zealous persecutor of the church. This message wasn't Paul's message. I wasn't persecuting the church one day. I said, you know what? I think I'll do something different. I think I'll work to establish the church. Paul says, this was God's. It it was not just a message he told me, but look at what else he says. He says, it was God who had set me apart before I was born. He called me by his grace. He revealed his son to me. This is God's deal. So here in verse 25, the first person we see is God. And we see that this message that Paul is called to proclaim is is from God. It's his message. Another person we see in this verse is Paul, right? How does Paul describe himself? Again, look at the the, the text. He says, the the church of which I became a minister. And we think, okay, a minister, maybe maybe that means a position of of prominence. He's he's a minister, he's a a leader. And that's not what Paul means here in this verse, I don't think. This word minister means to be a servant, Paul says, I I became a servant. He could have used the word slave here, but sometimes slaves would have positions of authority. The word servant here describes a person who's serving underneath someone else, and so it doesn't have that connotation of authority here. This is just a person who's underneath another person. He says, not just a minister, what else does he say? A minister according to the stewardship from God. What is... A stewardship. A stewardship refers to a person who's been put in charge of managing something for someone else. So a steward might be a servant of a master who owned some land, and the, the servant is a steward of that. It's, it's not his, it's, it's the master's, and he's just doing what the master tells him to do. The master has some, some money, gives it to the servant, says, take care of this money. He's a steward of something that belongs to someone else. When I was 15, 16 years old, I got got my first job at Arby's Fast Food Restaurant. And uh, I was the the lowest of the low on the totem pole there at Arby's Restaurant in Bedford, Texas. There There was no person who worked there that wasn't above me in authority. And I had no ability to just kind of go in and say, you know what, today, today I think I'm going to run the cash register. Or today, you know what, I think we're going to do a a special on the Arby's Melt, five for five dollars. What do you guys think? I don't care, I'm doing it. I had had no authority. I had no authority. No job since. (laughs) I'm a steward. Someone else's deal. 
Paul says, look, I'm a steward. This isn't my gospel message. This isn't my ministry of proclamation. God in his, his grace has said, okay, Paul, here's my message. Now you're my steward. You're my servant of the stewardship of the gospel message. Do it. So there's God. It's his message. He owns it. There's Paul. He, he's a minister, a servant of the stewardship. And here are the, who's the third person or the third group of people we see? It's, it's the you there in verse 25. You. Paul became a minister. Stewardship from God is given to me for you. For you to make the word of God fully known. Others are beneficiaries of the stewardship that Paul has been given. Now, what's the conclusion here? What, what's, what conclusion do we arrive at? Paul, Paul, and you, and me, whoever, must do what God wants. It's not his deal. When it comes to my ministry, what I want is irrelevant in terms of deciding what I'm going to do. In terms of deciding the, the task of ministry that I have before me, the goal of ministry, what I want is completely irrelevant to the question of, of what I need to do. It's God's deal. It's God's deal. It's God's ministry. God is completely and totally authoritative over how I live my life. God is the one who decides what ministry is. God is the one who defines what love in the church looks like. In fact, I, I think this is a, a good point in, in the message to kind of give a little bit of an illustration here and address uh, what took place on, on Friday with the Supreme Court decision. I think it's important to, to say something about that this morning. And I would say this, simply that I don't know if there's ever been a culture so committed to the idea of the autonomy of the individual as our culture is. In other words, I'm not sure if there's ever been a, a culture that so defines morality in terms of, of self-pleasure. It begins with defining morality with, with the, the sphere of the self. It's an astonishing place we find ourselves in. And, and a ministry that says, I'm going to define my ministry and its goals by, by myself as a ministry that has already failed the most fundamental thing that God has called us to. We must preach, we must do whatever ministry God has called us to do as a servant of God. In fact, let me unpack this a, a little bit more because I think it's so relevant to where we are this morning. L let me read a little bit more from a book I mentioned last week. It's called The Church and the Surprising Offense of God's Love. And it, it, it talks about how offensive the idea of God's love is. It's by Jonathan Lehman. And, and let me just read some things that he writes about love. He's talking here about the growth of individualism over the last several centuries and the Western world especially. And he's quoting a sociologist who tells the story of most marriages in pre-modern Europe. He says, most marriages in pre-modern Europe were entered into not for the sake of love, but for economic reasons. Marriage was a means of organizing labor, and, and even whenever love was spoken of in the context of marriage, it was characterized as the compassionate love between a husband and wife running a household or farm together. So they, they talk about love in a marriage relationship. They're talking about this, this compassion that a husband and wife would, would feel for each other. But this idea of romantic love wasn't necessarily in their minds as foremost in terms of describing love in a marriage relationship. It was only in the late 18th century, this sociologist argues, that romantic love began to arise amidst the flurry of novels, which situated the love relationship in a narrative of self-discovery and self-expression. So it's not that romantic love didn't exist before, but this idea that romantic love becomes that which trumps everything else, and this idea of the autonomy of the self and, and, and self-pleasure and self-discovery being the, the aim of our lives, it's a, it's a new concept. It's a new understanding of love. This is not something new that's or this is not something that's, that's uh, th this idea is something new in terms of it being the value for marriage and relationships and life. Martin Luther, in fact, whenever he talked about marriage, acknowledged 
romance and, and things like that. But he says, look, um, after we've slept off our intoxication, sincere love remains in the married life of the godly. The godless are sorry they ever married. He says, the ultimate purpose of marriage is to obey God, to find aid and counsel against sin, to, to call upon God, to seek love, educate children for the glory of God, to live with one's wife in the fear of God, to, to bear the cross. The romantic love, that Le- Lehman goes on to write this, the romantic love of the late 18th and 19th centuries differed most fundamentally from a biblical conception of love in this way. For the romantic lover... For the romantic lover, the point of absolute moral reference was an exclusive fidelity to the love relationship and its maximization. In other words, all morality became defined by what is going to maximize this this romantic love that I feel. That's, That's my morality. That's my standard of what's right and wrong. We need to understand we're in this culture, and we need to understand this is a radically new understanding of what love is. All their ties, familial, class, religious, became secondary and expendable for the sake of preserving this romantic love. What is it? It's, it's idolatrous. Human beings are to find their complete rest only in God, but the romantic lover finds his or her own soul's completion in the other, in love. It's not that all aspects of romantic love are wrong, but whenever Romantic love isolates one or two aspects of biblical love, which is more complicated, more multifaceted, layman writes. It makes romantic love the ultimate. It disturbs even that which is good in it. A little more, a little more here. He says, is this really love? It's really love. If that's all that love consists of. I myself become the true object of my affection. Instead of God being the true object of my affection, I become the true object of my affection. I might claim to love you, but it's really the way that you make me feel that I love. You make me feel accepted or smart, inspired, romantic, tingly, encouraged, special, warm and fuzzy, attractive, all that I can be. As John Piper said, we call it love when people make much of us. That's not biblical love. But we employ this idolatrous conception of love today as if it's the argument that ends all arguments. If an action is motivated by love, in other words, love meaning you're exalting me and what I want, it bears all the vindication it needs. It's the ultimate trump card. It's our ultimate standard of morality. Well, they love each other, or that doesn't seem like a loving thing to do, or what you're saying might be true, but it's not loving. That's where we are in our culture today. We have an idolatrous conception of love that says it doesn't matter what God says about the purpose of my life. I believe the purpose of my life, and this isn't just about what happened on Friday. Be very, let me be very clear on this. This is about the temptation in each one of our hearts to say, love is about me. Not about God. Not about how he desires me to live. Not about the sacrifices he calls me to make. But love is about me. That's idolatrous idolatrous. As I engage in ministry, I must preach underneath the authority of someone else. He tells me what this ministry is. I must preach as a servant of God. And as you engage in ministry, the purpose of the church is not to exalt you. The purpose of the church is not to be this idolatrous thing that is everything you've ever wanted an organization to be purpose of the church is to say, okay, God, what do you want this to be? And how can I serve you and others through it? It doesn't matter what color I want in the, the walls of the new building. It, it doesn't matter what I, I want the, the nursery to look like. It, it doesn't matter what time I want things to start. All these things, they don't matter. What matters is, am I being a servant of God? Am I being faithful to the stewardship he's given me, I must preach as a servant of God. Number two, here's the next thing. I must preach from the word of God. I must preach from the word of God. Look at verse 26. Okay, so he's just said, I became a minister. This this stewardship, my, my goal is to make the word of God fully known. 
And then he, he, here's what he says about the Word of God. The Word of God is the mystery. It contains the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Now, what is mystery? Mystery, we see in scriptures, is something that is, is secret, and then it's revealed by God's special revelation. And there's, there's two things I want you to see in this verse. First of all, there are some important truths about life that cannot be known apart from divine revelation. There are things about God and his character and his nature and about how we're to live in light of his character that we can't just inherently know in and of ourselves. I can't go outside, sit underneath a tree, and think real hard and find out everything that I need to know about God. I cannot sit down and talk with you, no matter how wise you are, and just kind of hear your thoughts and know everything that I need to know about God. There are some secret things that cannot be known without divine revelation. He refers to this mystery here, and this mystery is about God's intention to include the Gentiles in his plan of redemption. In fact, it goes beyond that. If you have your your Bibles there and and can, turn to Ephesians 3. I want you to see something kind of cool here. Ephesians 3, Paul is is talking about his stewardship again. He says, says, for this reason, I, Paul, this is verse 1, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you've heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. And then he says in verse 3, how the mystery was made known to me and by revelation, as I have written briefly, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is the mystery? The mystery, verse 6, is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So the mystery, first of all, reveals this, this, this idea that that the Gentiles are included in God's plan of redemption. And it goes on. Of this gospel, this good news, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then, in verse 9, we see it goes beyond just the Gentiles, right? And to bring to light for everyone... What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he's realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. And so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So, the first thing we see here is, look, there's important truths we see in verse 26 that, that cannot be known without divine revelation. And then we see, what else? That the Word of God is, is that which reveals that divine revelation. How can we know these things that we can't know apart from divine revelation? Well, in the Word of God. That's the source of the hidden things, the source of revelation about the hidden things. 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says we impart a secret We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before all the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Paul says, Paul says, look, there are things that we're imparting to you. It's, it's, it's secret. It's hidden wisdom. God's decreed these things before the ages for our glory, for our benefit. They're contained in his word. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 describes this. Open my eyes, the psalmist writes in verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Verse 24, your testimonies are my delight. The the word of God is my delight. They're they're my counselors. They they teach me about how to to view life, how to live. Things I wouldn't know apart from God's law. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. So, 
What does this mean? What this means is that it, it's only in God's word that we find out some of the most essential things we need to know about how to live life. I think that I have sometimes some funny observations about life to make, some witty words of wisdom, nice anecdotes. well-informed thoughts about the political situation of the day. There, there, are, there are things that are up there. But those can't be the content of what I talk about on a Sunday morning. As I think about the incredible privilege of, of being able to be before you on a Sunday morning, that the, the privilege that by God's grace y you've allowed me to have, the content of what I say must be the Word of God. That's what I have to spend my time talking about. And anything else that I say can potentially be a distraction. Everything that I say, even, even stories, all needs to point back to the Word of God and illustrating the, the points that God would have us know. Christians today, as one person has suggested, will talk and act as if emotionism is true. We may claim to care about doctrine, but too often our, our religion is conducted on an emotional plane. Here's what God's saying to me. Here's what I think God wants me to do. But look, what does God's word tell me to do? At the beginning of my sabbatical, we had the privilege of, of hearing from uh, Doug Van Meter. And uh, don't tell Doug this because I don't want the guy to struggle with pride, but He's one of my heroes, okay? He's one of my heroes. Uh, whenever he was a little bit younger, uh, kind of earlier in his, in his ministry there, there were some things that as he was teaching through the Word of God, there were some things he became convinced of that were at, at odds with what some other people believed in, in his church or in his, his association. And he said, look, um, guys, he came to his, to his elders and said, look, this is what I believe God's Word teaches, and, and, and this, is what I, this is what I've got to teach. Whatever you guys need to do, that, that's great, but this is what I'm going to teach. That commitment that, that Doug made, it cost him. It cost him some relationships that still have not been repaired. It cost him uh, the ease and the comfort of his family. His family just endured some, some terrible things as a result of, of that commitment. But I'll, I'll tell you this right now. Doug's ministry, as I look at, at his ministry, his ministry has been successful by absolutely every single standard that matters. Faithfulness to his family, faithfulness in shepherding his church, faithfulness to the word of God, faithfulness to proclaim what God says. Any measure of success in ministry, you that you would rightly judge a ministry by, he's been successful. As I've thought about that since that first week here, he was here, that's what I want my ministry to be like. I cannot do that unless I preach from the Word of God. It's our only possibility of success. My time is limited. Your time is limited. Your ministry is limited. We must remember the imperative of Paul in 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Here's the third thing I want us to think about here in verse 27. Not only must I preach as a servant of God, not only must I preach from the word of God, I must preach about the glorious Son of God. And look at what we see here in verse 27. Paul writes, to them, and he's talking here about the saints, the saints that this has been revealed to. He says, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope, the hope of glory. 
So what we see here, first of all, notice this. God divinely chooses to make himself known. Paul says God God chose, and that word there means to desire, to a deliberate act according to his purpose and what he wants to have happen. God, God chose to make himself known. Now, as we already have, have sung this morning, this is a mysterious thing. How in the world did, did this even happen? How, how would God choose to, to make himself known to us? It, it's beyond our comprehension, but it's what God chooses to do. He chooses to make known something, himself. This, this plan of redemption, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you, you, you have to catch this. Why? Why did God choose to reveal this? It's not just about the impartation of knowledge. It wasn't like God said, you know what, I've got this really cool puzzle. I mean, it's awesome. And, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show people what I did so that they will have this, just this knowledge. It's not the impartation of information for the, the sake of information's sake. You, you need to understand this because if we don't grasp this truth, let me put it this way. If this truth is not central to my preaching ministry, I preach in vain with no eternal benefit. If the ministry in which you get engaged doesn't grasp this central truth, the ministry in which you engage has no eternal benefit. So it's important. Why does God choose to reveal himself? Why does God want to make known how great he is among the Gentiles? It's not just the impartation of of content, of knowledge. It's the communication of his glory. God desires that people would know the glorious story of redemption so that they would engage in worship of him. To engage in worship of him, they need to see his beauty. You see this? The purpose of my preaching ministry is not just to teach you some academic facts about God. The purpose of my preaching ministry is to proclaim to you the beauty of Jesus Christ. And if I don't faithfully proclaim to you the beauty of Jesus Christ, my ministry is worthless. The content of his message specifically is Jesus Christ in you. And as we bring this all together this morning, we see, okay, look, God has brought together Jews and Gentiles in Christ, and he's reconciled them to himself, and that is a beautiful truth, and it's that truth that's the, the core of the gospel. Galatians 3.14, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Verse 26 of Galatians 3, in Christ Jesus, you're all sons of God through faith. Verse 28 of Galatians 3, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no slave or free. There's no male and female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 13, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ by abolishing the law of breast and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. When we were in Atlanta, uh, we went to the Coca-Cola Museum. And as you come into the Coca-Cola Museum, on the wall, there's this purpose statement of the the Coca-Cola, I guess, mission statement. It says something like, we exist, we exist to refresh the world. We exist to refresh the world. And as you go through the museum and you see the different exhibits and, and advertisements throughout, you know, the last century or whatever, that word refresh and refreshing, I mean, it's, it's everywhere, everywhere. We sat down in this, this uh, room and, and we watched a, a six-minute video, a Coca-Cola video. It's, it's basically a, a six-minute advertisement for Coca-Cola. And it was, in the background, there was a song, I'm on top of the world, or, or 
uh, top of the world, top of the world, whatever. And, and then there's, um, there's like six different stories that are kind of interspersed. They kind of start each story, and then they, they go to another story, and then they, they start another story and go to another story, and then they kind of go back to the first story, and then they go back to all the stories, and they kind of finish up all the stories. And so, like, there's a proposal. There's someone jumping out of an air, getting ready to jump out of an airplane, and then by the end they do. There's some kids trying to make this amazing basketball shot, and then by the end they do. There's a, a surprise birthday party for Grandma. I mean, it was just, um, it was the most manipulative piece of video that I've ever seen. It was terrible. But by the end of the video, I look over at my wife, and we both have, like, tears streaming down our face. And we want a Coca-Cola. <laughs> I'm thirsty for a Coca-Cola. I want that. I yearn for that. I want to be part of this, this big, refreshing world. You know? Now, to borrow a phrase from Coca-Cola, I've got the real thing, okay? I don't need to engage in manipulative gymnastics to get you to see the beauty of Jesus Christ, right? But Jesus Christ is beautiful, and if my ministry doesn't proclaim the beauty of Jesus Christ to you, there's, a, there's no eternal benefit. And so what I want to do each week by God's grace is say, okay, here's God's word. Here's, here's God's ministry. He wants me to tell you about Jesus, and, 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 and here he is. As, as Paul says it here, look, I, I'm look, looking at the text, I want you to know the, the riches of the glory. This is his, his glorious riches in the the, the word glory there connotates the, the presence of God. This is this fullness, this, this, this wealth, this glorious wealth of the mystery that's Christ in you. It's a beautiful thing, and, and that's what I want to proclaim. I want you each week to see the beauty of Jesus and to say, that's, that's who I want. That's who I, I want to, to be obedient to and, and to live for the glory of because his worth surpasses everything else. How do I do this? How do I do this? Well, it means that I can't get up here each week and proclaim moralism. Because moralism isn't beautiful. And it won't last for eternity. I can't get up here each week and say, hey, be good. Be good. Be nice to each other. Love your mama. Don't say bad words. That's not beautiful. It's not beautiful. It's nice, but it's not beautiful. It won't last for eternity. I can't get up here each week and say, uh, let, let me proclaim Daniel or, or Danielism. Here's some of my thoughts about how to live life. I mean, I agree with most of my thoughts, but they're not beautiful. They're not, be not going to last for eternity. They, they may not even last the week. I don't know. Not beautiful. I can't get up here and proclaim Bethanyism. I can't get up here and proclaim legalism. Legalism is, isn't beautiful. Don't do that. Uh, uh, sit up straight. Wear a, 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 this kind of tie, and 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 don't comb your hair that way. And you know, I, I can't proclaim legal, legalism each week. That's not beautiful. That won't last for eternity. What can I do? I can just take you to God's word. Say, look, here, here's God's plan. And, and let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is beautiful. Jesus Christ is of eternal benefit. And, and as you see the, the beauty of Jesus Christ, you say, okay, there, there's joy in knowing who he is and living my life in absolute obedience to him because he is glorious. And I want to be obedient to him, and I want to live my life for his glory, not because I have to, but because it is this, this great, solemn joy to have the opportunity to participate in life in him. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we'd be faithful to that in each of our ministries. We pray that, that we would see in our, our ministries not anything but your son, Jesus and you glorified in his name. We pray that each of us would have a desire to live in obedience to you, that we'd have a desire to, to be faithful in ministry, that you'd enable us to do so 
with all that the strength that you work within us for your glory. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 